Let's look right here for a moment. The great crash is just in front of us. The great fear is down the road. This is not the end. The end is over here. This is the one that Jesus said, but the end is not yet. I mean, this is the one that everybody thinks is the end. This will be the great fear right here. That's the kaboom. This one right here is going to see this piecing together of powers, states, systems, whatever, to deal basically with the global economy. That's the first and great order of business. So in this period of time, I believe that while we're not going to see rosy days, we are going to have at least enough uh, juice in the system to... Well, we can print some books. It'll be hard. It'll be tough. But we can print a few. Let's print a few. Let's do whatever. Um, we can travel over there, but we can't get farther than that. Let's go that far. Let's do whatever. I see that in this period of time, which is basically three to three and a half years. All you have to do is go back and read about the Great Depression and see how it developed in 1929, the ING was in October of 1929, but the Depression reached its depths three and a half years later in 1932. Isn't that amazing? See? This is what we're going to see right here. Here, that's a horse of a different color. Every pun intended. Things are going to change dramatically here for the whole planet, for everyone. We'll come to that in a few moments. Here at the Great Crash, this confederacy, this coming together is going to be concerned basically with matters of economy. When the Great Fear arrives, suddenly Jerusalem is going to be the cup of trembling in the hands of the nations. Right here. Something is going to happen that is going to bring Jerusalem, and that little piece of real estate over there we call Israel, Palestine, Holy Land, whatever you want to call it, <coughs> going to bring it front and center. And the whole planet is going to tremble. I mean tremble. I mean it's going to look like this is it. This is why Jesus said, and read it in the three Gospels, the conversation he has with his disciples about the end, but the end is not yet. Why does he say that? Because everyone thinks it's the end. But the end is not. All these things must be, but the end is not yet. Now we've got three and a half measured years. And when I say three and a half, you've got to understand that Bible math is weird, weird, weird. When you say a half, it's not precisely a half. The great fear. In this period of time, this is a personal conclusion. In this period of time, I believe that wherever we find ourselves during this period is where we will basically spend the rest of our days here. I, just don't, I don't see us having the money, the freedom, the whatever else to move about go buy a place, go do whatever we're going to do. We've got this little bit of time, but it's going to be a lot tougher here than it is right here. That's today. A lot tougher. Difficult. Troubling. We're going to move from economic matters to church matters. And finally... The ultimate solution is to number and mark everybody on the planet so we can tax everyone. All of this was typed when Jesus came the first time. The reason, the reason Joseph put a wife of nine months on a donkey is because, please listen, the government demanded that every person be numbered. Read it in the book. 
some translations read text. And you had to go to a certain place, the place of your birth. You had to be, this was throughout the whole Roman Empire. This was not just in Israel. He causeth all, the whole world. So there's a progression in here. And we have to understand that in this progression, our freedoms, our abilities will be limited, limited, limited until finally. This is why when you read Ellen White, who thought all of this was a hundred years ago, she says, I saw that those who had a place to go and take their families where they could grow something to eat would live like kings and queens. That didn't happen a hundred years ago, folks. You know what Gerald Salenti said in a recent interview? This guy that Beck was talking to there? He said in two years, he said that this year, he said in two years, the great gift that you and others will give at Christmas will be food. The greatest gift people will give in two years at Christmas will be food. And I, you, you, you look at people and they say, oh, no, no, oh, no, that, that, that's not possible. Out in that van, I brought my current issue of Scientific American feature article. World food will famine bring the world down. Where is that? What's that reference? Scientific American. And they're showing 10 years ago what the food reserves were on the planet, then five years, and today. There's 62 days of food grain reserves on the planet. 62 days. In 62 days, you cannot grow another crop. You, can, you cannot grow another crop in 62 days. So the world is beyond being fed right now. If This is the world talking. They're not talking Bible prophecy. This is the world. They see the handwriting's on the wall. It's also on the board, see. Now, we want to look here and come here. This becomes a focal point. And by that, I mean soon, I'm quoting Ellen White again, soon great lines of prophecy will be fulfilled as it were in a moment of time. Now, I could tell you that's happening here, and I would not be mistaken. But this is where the real supreme prophetic event occurs, right here. What it does is move the attention of the whole world here. Because that has always been the issue. From cover to cover. That has been the issue. This point, which I've referred to this morning several times as the kaboom, is significant. And here's why. God called Moses up into the mountain. And he said, Moses, I'm going to give you a blueprint. I'm going to give you a plan. And you and Aaron are going to tell the people this is how we're going to build the edifice, the complex, the temple, the sanctuary, the tent, the whatever. See? This is what you're going to do. And Moses, not only am I going to give you a blueprint of the tabernacle, the sanctuary, but I'm going to give you a blueprint of the times. I'm going to give you a calendar of times in which I will meet with you. I will visit you, God says. So... Um, it happens that the times that were given to Moses were based upon a calendar of 360 days a year. 29 to 30 days a month. We know this. We understand this. Wonderful. However, with the passing of time, something happened in the days of Isaiah the prophet. Jeremiah and Hezekiah the king. 
And it happened at Passover. In a jubilee year. Are you listening? Now these things are not coincidental, folk. They, they're just, they're not coincidences. There was a flyby in the heavens. The Assyrians had surrounded Jerusalem. Hundreds of thousands of Assyrian soldiers. They'd already taken the ten tribes away in the north. They were here to finish the job and take away Benjamin and Judah. Poor Hezekiah, he's day and night on the floor. He's not on his knees. He's lying flat on the floor and he's crying. God help me. God save me. God show me what to do. Please, please, please. Isaiah, go pray for me, please. And Isaiah goes and prays. Meanwhile, Sennacherib, the evil king, who has an evil plan in mind, oversteps his bounds. And he challenges the God of Israel. And God speaks through Isaiah and says, go back and tell Hezekiah, stop crying, it's all over. It's no longer his fight, but mine. And at midnight, on Passover, in a jubilee year, God rained hot rocks down out of heaven on the Assyrians. And when they woke up in the morning, they were all dead men, it says. 185,000 of them. Hot rocks out of heaven. Who's the Jewish king? Hezekiah. 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 Now, there are all kinds of strange astronomical phenomena associated with this time and this event. But it's also associated with the times and the seasons, the sanctuary times and seasons, and the cycles in the sanctuary that we've just alluded to briefly here. All right? What happened was a flyby. How do we know that? Because in 701, 702, possibly 686, 687, but we're going to say 701, 702. You have to do it backwards because it's B.C. There was a flyby. Something passed by in the heavens. Large enough, massive enough, near enough that it disturbed our orbit around the sun. We were going 360 days, a near-perfect orbit around the sun in a year. That's a cycle. We had a flyby, I believe, outside our orbit, which thus ellipsed us and added five and a quarter days to a year. So what? I have people all the time, well, so what? Well, here's the so what. All the times given to Moses were based upon a calendar of 360 days a year. So when people come along and they start telling me, well, uh, I think we should keep the feast days. When I got to B.C., I pulled out my Jewish book printed in Israel and I said, well, you're here on this date, but I'd like to show you out of Israel that you're a week off. Somehow they didn't smile. I said, here's reality. You don't know if it's the right day. They don't know if it's the right day. No one knows if it's the right day. Because the clock's been tampered with. Because the calendar's been tampered with. Right here. Five and a quarter days. This is all a matter of history. A matter of verifiable history. So much so that around the world, various civilizations around the world had to redraw their own calendars and some of the brighter folk did it in two years and others took as much as 22 years to get the job done. You want to talk about the Mayan calendar after a while? We will. And by the way, it was the Mayan calendar that called the five and a quarter days the evil days, the unwanted days, the unmentionable days. <coughs> and it was what happened there that allowed them to... Anyhow. Outside. God, through Daniel, tells King Nebuchadnezzar, God showed you, O king, what will be in the latter days, for God will change the times and the seasons. Oh, let's fly by on the inside this time, maybe, which retrogrades the orbit, and we come back to sanctuary time. Well, why is that significant? Because, you see, 
Daniel didn't come along until a hundred years later than Hezekiah. And Daniel is living under a calendar that you and I are living under, but God gives him visions of the time of the end in the calendar of the sanctuary based on 360 days a year. Have I lost you? Daniel shut up the words and sealed the book until the time of the end. When God resets the clock. Absolutely necessary. Absolutely scriptural. Absolutely reasonable. Because to work out the numbered days in Daniel and Revelation based upon the calendar that the world observes right now, it doesn't work. It doesn't fit. I believe, this is personal, I believe that right here, Something happens, and there's a flyby in the heavens. And we have a new calendar. Now, let's give you a little bit of evidence to support this, okay? Come on. Go to Luke 21. Now, you can read this very same verse, very same verse, in Matthew and Mark. But it reads differently in Matthew and Mark. What's different in Matthew and Mark is that it's not as complete as Luke 21 and verse 11. And here's the part that's included. Verse 11. Great earthquakes. What did we talk about? The great rift. And it's caused by what? Tremendous earthquakes that create these faults. And earthquakes jiggle faults. And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places and famines and pestilences. And please take note. And fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. Now for years, I've expected that flyby to come at Passover. Recently, I've changed my mind. We'll discuss that later on in sanctuary time. Look, folk, right here. I am thoroughly convinced this is where the arrival in the heavens changes the times and the seasons. I'm going to say this and then we'll get into it in the final session when we deal with sanctuary time. All right? God changes the times and the seasons but not the days. The times are years and the seasons are months or seasons. But he doesn't change the days. Even when this event occurs, a day will still be a day, will be a day, will be a day, and you will count days. It was this realization on the plane from Vancouver that just, you know, set me spinning. God does not change the days until Jesus arrives. And then he stops the sun and the moon. And he stops the days. And there shall be time no longer. Here he changes the times and the seasons. When Jesus arrives, he puts an end to the days as we count them and measure them. And he makes new heavens and a new earth. And for a thousand years we're redrawing, redrawing, we're moving this little rock we're on into a new parking orbit. Personally, I see a flyby in the heavens that will dazzle the world, frighten the world, change the world, bring every last rock still standing atop one another in the temple that Jesus referred to down, bring the dome of the rock down, and set the stage for a counterfeit Armageddon. Now, don't ask me if I think that could occur on December 21 of 2012. <laughs> See, don't ask, no tell. Yeah, I think the possibility looms large. But that's for a later discussion. The great fear right here. It's very possibly at this time that the Israelis will take care of Damascus. 
And that event coupled with everything that's going on here will very likely, very likely set the stage for the one world order. That's the beast that we picture in Daniel 7 after the little horn appears. That's the beast that appears in Revelation 13 and verses 1 through 10. Um, that's the picture, the image in Revelation 13. See, in the first 10 verses, the first beast, the composite beast, is the fourth beast of Daniel 7, called the diverse beast, the terrible beast. The second beast of Revelation 13, which Advent pioneers turned into a <laughs> buffalo and said, you know, that's the United States of America. Oh, it's only partially, 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 very little partially correct. That second beast is the little horn of Daniel 7. That's the religiosity coming to the front. Who marries that composite beast and now we have this picture put together see this beast put together and then we have the three and a half years both of Daniel and Revelation 13 that are foretold that's in here so there's a tremendous frightening fearful event on the planet here and there will be consequences to follow. And of course, in a time of great fear, people are turning to the church. They'll fill the churches and they'll be looking for, you know, pray for me and pray for us. And what does all this mean? And anyhow, we need to look at this as a change from a new world order to a one world order. And once again, we repeat this process. This is strange stuff. Once again, we're taking care of the economy. We're going to do that with giving everybody a number and taxing and all of this kind of thing. How does Jerusalem come in? Because that's the Battle of Armageddon. That's when the Islam comes and says, we've been duped. This whole thing was a uh, Judeo-Christian trick to get Jerusalem. We're coming to get it. You can check that out in Ezekiel. You can check it out in Daniel 11. This time the Chinese come with them. We've got to take care of two billion on the planet. Right here. So, let's do this again. Simplify matters a little bit if we can. Seven years, please understand that's give or take. And it's really take, not give. Because the seven years are cut short. I'm convinced this is what Jesus referred to when he said, except those days be, it says shortened, but the idea is, except those days be few left, no flesh should be saved out of it. But for the elect's sake. So let's talk in terms of seven years. Why? Because there's so much prophecy here. There's so much sanctuary evidence here. It looks this way. If there are indeed seven years, then you and I are right here. If the reading and interpretation is correct. We're right before whatever the boom is. Say, right here. This is going to change matters for you and me. The global economy may be doing this, but the U.S. economy is going to do this. Make no mistake about it. It doesn't mean we no longer have military might. Personally, I believe we're going to give our military might over to the world order and we're going to be the policemen of the world legitimately. But hard times. I, I, I want to address this with you and me. If you're a Sabbatarian, finding employment has been a problem for a lot of people. There are a lot of Sabbatarians, many Sabbatarians, who could be gainfully employed, far more gainfully employed 
if they were not Sabbath keepers. They may have to settle for some position that is not quotes, you know. Here, there's going to be increased difficulty. Why? Because I think the 25%, this is personal, I think the 25% unemployment of the Great Depression is going to be 50% in the Great, Great Depression. And so if you are a person with a church-going problem and there's a little bit of work, you're the last guy on the totem pole. I mean, come on. doesn't take a whole lot of brain power to figure this one out. I see that in this period of time, Sabbatarians are going to be at a real disadvantage. That's what I see. I may be mistaken. Hooray if I am. I see it's going to be more difficult for us than the average Joe or Jane out there. Well, there are two ways of looking at this. One, money as was said on the DVD this morning. Money, you know, greases the wheels. This is how the system works. This is how the world turns. Yes, but we need to be reminded that after the great disappointment at the cross, they showed up in Jerusalem and uh, they announced at the temple, silver and gold have we none. But such as we have, we give. So God is going to counterbalance these hard times, these difficult times, I am convinced, by giving, offering, giving an added measure of His Spirit. Will I call this the latter rain? Maybe in early stages. But this will be an opportunity for you and me to live by faith. If you've never been there, happy day. To live by faith. You're going to have to trust God for your next meal, your next whatever. And we haven't even gotten to the hard times. See? I'm just telling you what I see in here. And I see this based upon the past, based upon Bible history, based upon real history, based upon even recent history in this country with the Great Depression, etc., etc. I see that the church is very likely going to be, and I'm talking about as an organization, is very likely going to either come apart right here or be weakened to the point that organizationally it will scarcely resemble an organization. Why? Because organizations have to have money to stay alive. You need to understand that in the Great Depression, when the church was faced with serious difficulty, I'm talking about the Advent church, the Adventist church, when it was faced with serious financial difficulties in the Depression, that many Adventist ministers were, I won't say let go, I won't say fired, but the conferences could no longer pay them. And isn't it interesting that most of those ministers left the denomination and never came back? Will the past be repeated? I shall not say. I see a real shaking as far as believers are concerned. Real soon. We're here. That's, I believe, is what's staring us in the face. This can be problematic. This can be um, devastating. Or this can be a blessing. It all depends on how we see it, how we view it, how we respond to it. I know for many it's going to be devastating. I do believe it's going to be liberating. If you understand. 
I'm not anti-organization. I'm not. Our little ministry is an organization. We have to have money to stay alive like any other organization. I'm not anti-organization. I'm only telling you God has a purpose and a plan right here, and that purpose is, is to teach you and me to live by faith so when the real testing time comes, we don't give up. We have seen him deliver, 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 deliver. So when the days of testing really arrive, we can hold on. Just telling you what I see. Now, with all of this in mind, a dollar today is beyond value here. In other words, do what you can now. Do it now. Do it today while the sun is shining. Because right here, very difficult. And in this time, we're going to be bearing a witness. And I believe God's going to give us a measure of His Spirit. A measure. The outpouring comes over here on all flesh. I'm looking at you. You still haven't gotten the I-N-G-E-D thing. The I-N-G started with 120. You tarry until the promise of the Father and then you will be witnesses for me. First in Jerusalem, then in Judea, then into Samaria, then to the uttermost parts of the earth. That's the I-N-G. Here's the E-D. Look back. See ahead. Don't overlook what's going on here. Let me play this out in six minutes. Nebuchadnezzar is the evil king who came against Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar is the, the, the bad guy who came and destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed Solomon's glorious temple and led away captive the children of Israel. Nebuchadnezzar is no nice guy. He came as a general. He was not yet King Nebuchadnezzar. It's while he was surrounding Jerusalem, preparing to breach the walls, that messengers from Babylon came and said, Your daddy died. Come home, hurry, so you can be crowned king. He rushed the short way across back to Babylon, was received coronation, and came back to finish the job at Jerusalem. You got, you, you, you got to understand the I-N-G to the E-D in this process. So, this Nebuchadnezzar tears down the city, destroys the temple, takes the very articles that belong to God that are declared holy unto God and hauls them away and puts them in his false god temple. This is no nice guy. He gives all kinds of orders. He says, you go and choose some of these boys that look like they got a little more brain power going for them and you train them here and you school them there and you do this and you change their names. He thinks he's Daniel, El for Elohim. No, no, no. He's Belteshazzar for Bel. I mean... Everything that could be done to take the Jewishness out of the Jews was set into motion. See? Everything. But God made a way through all of that. If you want to call uh, being made a eunuch a way through it. If you want to call spending the rest of your life a captive in Babylon a way through it. <clears throat> the king is given this dream. We all know the dream. The great metallic image. The king says, my sleep break from me. It was fearful. Whatever it was, I can't remember. Wise men come and tell me. So God makes a way for Daniel to come into the presence of the evil king. 
So what does Jesus tell his disciples? And they will bring you before. And you will be witnesses for me. Who did they bring Jesus before? The evil king. Come on. You and I are going to be brought through circumstance before the kings of the earth, before the rulers of the earth, Jesus says. You are going to become witnesses for me. Don't worry about what you're going to say. And so Daniel says to this king, this guy who has destroyed his city, killed his people, maybe even his parents, brought him all the way over to Babylon and and Daniel comes into the presence of this mighty evil king and bears a testimony. He says, but there's a God in heaven. <sighs> Anyhow, a few years go by. How many? I don't know. A few years go by, and this ruthless king has another dream. This one he can remember. He just doesn't know what it means. Daniel's along in years now. I know there's a Hebrew who can tell me the meaning of the sin for Daniel. Belteshazzar. So Daniel is brought in. And the king says, Daniel, I had this dream last night. Tell me what it means. And Daniel said, um, I don't want to tell you what it means. Because it's not good. That's all right. You tell me what it means. Well, he said, you're going to turn into a jackass. Read it. You mighty king are going to become a beast and eat grass in the field like all the other beasts out there. You're going to lose your mind. You're going to lose your sanity. You're going to lose your station. You're going to lose everything till seven times pass over you. Superpower. By the way, the fourth chapter of Daniel was written by Nebuchadnezzar, not by Daniel. Check it out. And Nebuchadnezzar's testimony at the end of the seven years was, and when seven times had passed, I praised the God. Daniel's God. He's coming. Say. No, there's seven years. That bothers me. Three and a half is bad enough. Seven years, that's an eternity. The difficulty here is, you and I have to bear a witness in here. We must bear a witness in here. That's our calling. Jesus said so. You are my witnesses. Now, when this time comes, you will be betrayed by, come on, brethren, kinsmen, See, when he says brethren, he's not talking about blood brothers. He's talking about church brothers. No, no. You will be betrayed when this time comes by brethren, kinsmen. Those are relatives and friends. Some of you, they will put to death. You're going to be sold out just like I was. This happened before. If we know any of this, if we ascertain any of this, if we comprehend any of this, then the moment that we have right now is beyond, is priceless. It's beyond measure. It's beyond, it's beyond words. It's, this is due before die. Right here. Right here.